Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this final session of the 2020 Caldor Centre Annual Conference. My name is Jane McAdam, and I'm the director of the Caldor Centre. At the outset, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. This session, the closing session of the conference, brings together two outstanding women, Tendai Achume and Nyadol Nguyen, to discuss how racism and displacement intersect and whether the international refugee protection regime is part of the problem or part of the solution. Tendai is Professor of Law at the University of California and a research associate of the African Center for Migration and Security at Wits University in South Africa. She is also the UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia and Related Intolerance, and she's the first woman to serve in this role since it was created in 1994. Tendai was awarded the UCLA Distinguished Teaching Award, which is the highest university-wide honour for excellence in teaching. And when it comes to her scholarship, her work is renowned for its incisive analysis of race, xenophobia, and the ethical implications of colonialism for contemporary international migration. Her work challenges us to recognise the race problem of international refugee law scholarship. So welcome, Tendai. Nyadol Nguyen is a community advocate, writer, lawyer, and an accomplished public speaker. She was born in a refugee camp in Ethiopia. She was raised in Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya. And then she moved to Australia in 2005 as a refugee. She obtained her BA from Victoria University and her JD from Melbourne Law School. And she now works as a commercial litigator with Arnold Block Liebler in Melbourne. In 2019, Nyadol won the Diversity and Inclusion category in Australia's 100 Women of Influence Awards. In 2018, she won the Australian Human Rights Commission's Racism It Stops With Me Award for her advocacy on behalf of the, of the Australian African and Melbourne South Sudanese communities. And in 2016, she was the recipient of the Future Justice Prize. So welcome Nyadol. This session is going to run as a conversation between our two speakers. You can still submit your questions via the Q&A tab on Zoom, and you can vote on questions that you like if you'd really like them to be answered. We'll try to get through as many of those questions as we can. Uh, the speakers may choose to take them as they go or turn to them towards the end. So I'd now like to welcome both our speakers, Tendai and Yadol, to commence their conversation. Uh, thank you very much, Jane, for that introduction. It's a huge pleasure to be, um, well, I was going to say on the same table, but clearly on the same Zoom <laughs> with Tendai, um, and to really get to also learn myself from having this conversation with you. Uh, we're going to be exploring, exploring a number of themes, and I wanted to start with the first one, which is the you know, phenomenon and experience of racism and its impact on refugees. And as part of that, what you know, wanted to cover is, um, you know, just the general question about racism and xenophobia and whether it's on the rise, uh, whether you're seeing any new manifestations in, or, you know, new or old manifestations of, of this kind of attitudes against refugee and asylum seekers. And how do you think racism and xenophobia impacts refugees or um, and other forced immigrants? To bring that all together, I think I'll just frame it into the first question. Uh, based on your experience as the UN Special Rapporteur, can you reflect on any trends or development in relation to any of these questions, any of the, the, the previous three questions? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Nadal. I can't tell you how excited I am to be in this conversation with you as well. And Jane, thanks for that really um, generous um, introduction. And thanks also to all of the participants who have uh, joined us. I, I recognize a number of the names and it's, it's an honor to, to be in conversation um, with you all. So what I thought I might do is um, 
before diving into some of the trends that I think are useful to pay attention to and before diving into how in my work as special rapporteur and then also in my academic work, I think about the relationship between race and refugees. I think it's helpful to just start with some definitional terminology that can help when we're having conversations about race and xenophobia and things like this. So I think that um, it's important for, for refugee advocates, for refugee scholars and, and for people, human rights advocates generally working in, in this area to really confront race as a social construct, of course, but one that definitely has uh, very real impacts and structuring the way that people experience um, access to human rights and experience their day-to-day -day experiences. And so um, we might think about, about race as a social construct that imbues physical features with social and legal and economic meaning, operating at the level of kind of how individual bodies are treated because of their appearance and their interactions with police with immigration enforcement, with healthcare officials, but also thinking about race at a structural level and thinking about how in many societies right now, race actually is a structure that determines who has access to what. And in the context of the COVID pandemic, for example, you're seeing that its impact on different groups is definitely racialized in ways that speaks to the continuing salience of race as a kind of access of um, subordination. And, and I also want to highlight that, you know, in our conversation, and even though we're going to be talking very much about contemporary structures, it's important to understand the origins of race as a category in, in the ways that we will be talking about it and to connect it to sort of um, colonial empire, whether we're talking about settler colonial empires, you might talk about in the context of, of Australia, but other forms of, of colonial empire as well, where race emerges as a technology for, as I mentioned, just essentially allocating rights among um, different groups. If we think about race in all of those ways, and if, if we think about racism as related to race, I think we have to confront the fact that racism fundamentally shapes the experience um, of refugees. It drives their flights, it shapes the nature of their flight, and it also shapes their reception wherever they go, right? And of course, race is not operating on its own. Race interacts with religion, it interacts with gender, it interacts with um, sexual orientation. And so it's also important, I think, to have an intersectional eye on the way that racial discrimination and other forms of exclusion um, are operating where refugees are, are concerned. And so if you think about racism in relation to xenophobia or xenophobic discrimination, which is a distinction that I think is a useful one to make, and my title is Special Rapporteur, has racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance. I think for refugees, this difference is a really important one to highlight, you know? Um, refugees experience harm on account of racism, but also on account of, of, of xenophobia or xenophobic discrimination, which is about their construction as kind of foreigners who un, are undeserving of the benefits of national membership in the different places that they are. And again, foreigners can be about race, it can be about religion, it can be about gender, but it is this um, intersectional um, category. So in terms, with, with that long background, that long-winded background, to get to, to the questions that you were asking me about the way that um, race affects uh, refugees. So you might think about the very definition of a refugee and who it grants protection to and, and who it excludes from protection. And I think even at that level, the scholars who've written about that cut itself as one that being that, that is a racializing um, cut, right? And, and you see this in different contexts. In the US context, for example, there's been definitions of who is included and excluded that results in particular national origin groups or, or particular ethnic groups being denied protection because of kind of race racialized ways of interpreting um, what refugee law looks like. You can think about the way that immigration, I mean, asylum policy um, enacts forms of racialized exclusion. And if we're talking about Australia and we're talking about its border externalization processes and the various mechanisms that it's implemented to make it difficult for people to seek asylum, when we see the groups that are most impacted, those, those groups are racialized groups and they're groups that are being kind of excluded on a disparately um, racial um, basis in a way um, that makes me wonder that if we went to Nauru or we went to one of the other islands, would we see a white person in detention there, even though it's clear that you have um, people who travel and unauthorized across different um, uh, racial groups. Um, in terms of trends that I've focused on in my capacity as special rapporteur, um, 
in the last five to six years, you've seen the rise in the use of things like national origin or religion bans on, on refugees. So you had this in the, U, in the US, you had this in parts of Europe, for example, in response to the Syrian refugee crisis with specific groups, specifically um, refugees fleeing from Muslim majority countries were fa facing bans that disproportionately um, excluded them um, from, from protection in ways that were uh, really um, troubling. And, and I would say another um, axis of racial and xenophobic discrimination that's been especially heightened and that I've noticed in the context of, of my mandate has been the demonization of refugees and refugees of color in particular as kind of carrying the pathogens that are associated with the pandemic. And so that kind of racialized demonization has resulted in increased racist and xenophobic attacks in addition to structural forms of exclusion and marginalization of refugees and, and asylum seekers in, in, in the pandemic context. So this is, all to say, I think there is a very serious problem here. It is one that has historical um, origins and we could pass it at multiple levels, but I think um, it's irresponsible to have conversations about the rights of refugees in most contexts without thinking about how racism and xenophobia is, is kind of inflecting the conditions under which they're living. That's so, so, I was just sitting, I think, feeling like I was in a lecture and I wanted it to continue. I hope everyone else is enjoying, enjoying this session. But it made me think about something when you when you were talking about the, the impact of um, COVID-19 and the kind of coverage of refugees as, as, as either spreading the disease or even in some instances, you know, in, at least in Australia, the debate was almost as if we were impacting the government policy or government reaction to limit uh, or to deal with, with the disease. The conversations, especially talking about refugees, tend to construct these, this conversation around people who are out of the country seeking to get into the country. But what I find fascinating even with, with the conversation about race and COVID-19 is how even people who are already settled in those countries, who, but who came as refugee or who look like refugees or immigrants, Mm -hmm. escape that and and how that then feeds almost a double narrative of well look we've already created a problem by bringing them here they do not mm -hmm. language they do not integrate this you know they're hindering our ability to deal with national or public health issues and therefore as a result we should not let more of them in we should you know exclude even more of them um and it's it's an interesting interaction between even whereas someone who like me as came to Australia is now a citizen, I'm still referred to as a South Sudanese refugee, as a South Sudanese lawyer, as, as, and, and, and how my treatment or the treatment of people who look like me continue to feed the conversation about how refugees are, are treated. Do you have any, any comment on that, about that kind of domestic yeah. narrative sort of flowing into having a kind of foreign policy impact? Yeah, you know, I think that that is a is a really powerful insight and one that I think speaks to why, you know, so in, in different contexts, in, in my capacity as special rapporteur, I often encounter state actors and even humanitarian aid actors, human rights act actors who say, look, why are you going on about, about race or ethnicity or any of these categories? That's not what this is about. This is about immigration status. You know, this is about exclusion of non-nationals or it's, it's about citizenship-based exclusion. And I think your example really gets at the heart of the fact that for refugees and migrants of color, um, their race kind of functions as a border. This is how I, I often think about it, where even if you are fully, you know, incorporated in legal terms through citizenship status or whatever case, or whatever the case might be, there's a perpetual outsider status, a perpetual subordinate status, a perpetual kind of threat status that is imbued to you because of the social construction of your race that even legal categories um, can never overcome. And you know, your experience in Australia, I think, is one that is reproduced all over the world. And so when I do country visits, I've done country visits to the United Kingdom, um, to the Kingdom of the Netherlands, to, to Morocco and to Qatar. And in all of those places, you find 
people who had refugee status who are naturalized, who are citizens, some who were never refugees, some who've been there for, for generations and generations, sometimes as a result of kind of the way that colonial empire uh, works, but who to this day on the basis of their race are constructed as foreign and as perpetually part of the problem and subordinated in kind of labor market, subordinated in the healthcare context, Whereas, for example, and this is an example from the Netherlands, I wouldn't be surprised if the same was true in Australia, you'll have, you know, people who travel, say, from white people who travel from the US, who are based in the Netherlands, who are kind of presumed um, insiders, right, on the basis of their racialization in ways that really trouble um, what you're describing. So I think, I think it's, it's, to me, your um, insight, which is about how even after you overcome the hurdles associated with legal status, refugees and you know, people of color will sustain, will remain constructed as outside of the nation, speaks to a need to really grapple with how belonging is racialized, how national security is racialized, how outsider status is racialized in ways that most nations are actually not willing um, to confront, or at least the majorities in most nations are not um, willing to confront. I want to pick up two points. The first is that this notion of your race um, always functioning as a border and those who are presumed to be insiders. Because so I think that two categories, at least in my view in Australia, really plays a big part in defining who is a domestic and national threat. Mm -hmm. and, so it's, and, and it's quite, I use the word fascinating partly because analytically it's, it's, it's interesting because it exposes so much incoherence and double standard, the treatment of treating one class of people differently. But of course the, the results are, are horrific. So you would find even, um, you know, migrants who appear to be white um, or who are white, uh, sort of because of their presumed insiders, being insiders, taking on that role and clearly saying that other immigrants, you know, who, a brown or black or you know indigenous are then constructed as the foreigners, the constant foreigners. And it's it's a lot of the conversation about whether we should settle refugee, whether we should have a, a more generous um, refugee policy over the last years has shifted, in my view, to more conversations about immigration and really a threat either to the internal coherency of the country. They, 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 the way we live, they change our attitude, or then the other conversation is threat to national security. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The terrorist, they are gangs, um, mm -hmm. they believe religious, they do not believe in our legal systems. Mm -hmm. So it's moved away from, I think, conversations about necessarily being directly racist, you know, mm -hmm. so a black, the monkey, the that to this new form of almost what seem intellectual, you know, debates about national cohesion and national security. So this mm -hmm. changing of, of, of language that have exactly the same consequence yeah. in very different terms. And I find, I think that makes it really hard mm -hmm. for people to advocate against or even point out that racism plays a function in how these debates are framed because they're not framed with race as visibly a central part of it. Does that make, does that make sense? No. Yeah, no. no. I think it absolutely, it absolutely does. And I think your comments really, it's like they really challenge us to think about the level at which racialized encoding takes place, right? And we're definitely living in a time when you know, the rise of ethno-nationalist populism in different parts of the world, Australia included, mean that people are free to express racist, explicitly racist sentiments in ways that I think were untrue, say, a decade um, ago. But I think you're right to point out that the most kind of 
toxic racialized forms of exclusion and harm that I think prevail in, in most societies. It's encoded in these other ways of, of othering and talking about other that make it really difficult to kind of directly confront as kind of racial project. So you're right to point to national security or kind of security threats, you know, the gangs, the terrorists. And, and what's fascinating is that all of these terms are racialized. When you say terrorist, when you say gang, in so many parts of the world, the image that is conjured up in most people's minds is of people of color and, and people of color who then have the outsider label of kind of refugee or migrant um, attached to them. And it's not an accident, right? So the, the racialization of national security, which I think is peddled by media sources, by political actors, um, really bakes kind of racialization into the the kind of the, the baseline levels of analysis so that then it's not necessary to even say what we don't want here is people of color. You can just say what we don't want is gangs and what we don't want is is terrorists. And yeah. it's been it's it's been interesting. So I've, I one like very concrete way that this has manifest in my work as as um special rapporteur is witnessing how counterterrorism frameworks in so many parts of the world have focused on black and brown individuals, especially Muslims, completely ignoring the threat of white supremacists and kind of extreme right wing groups, which in many parts of the world have been em emboldened by the rise of kind of leaders who embolden that way of behaving. And you see states scrambling to even conceive of kind of white supremacist and white nationalist threats as threats to the nation, in my opinion, because often white supremacist ideologies are so baked into what counts as the nation that it's even, it's like it's short circuit, short circuits the national security discord to confront whiteness and those forms of whiteness as a threat, you know? So, so I think your point is absolutely right. And then it makes it hard for advocates, you know, to to speak out against those forms of racialization because it's like, well, what are you talking about? Don't you care about the security of the country? I don't know if your experiences re resonate with this Nyadol, but in many places I find people who will say that then actually raising questions around racialization are met with kind of a defensiveness or a kind of why are you bringing in race when it's not about race, it's about security or kind of why are you so defensive about these issues in ways that again, I think diffuse um, the capacity to really get at them. Well, one way I experienced that directly was um, was uh, we some years back there was the founder of um, a, a far right group that had um, been identified as a hate group, and this guy had made videos, had said things like "We will choke you, we will kill you." He was anti-immigrants, he undermined you know indigenous people. He was racist, he was xenophobic, he was you know, and, and he made it really clear. You know, he made videos about them where he threatened direct violence. And in addition to just sort of having forming this group, the group was consistently engaging in violence in places like United States, in places like Portland, where it got to the point where I think they were considering bringing in laws just to deal with, with the impact of the violence that some of this group have brought. And the, um, the founder of that organization wanted to come to Australia for a tour, a comedy tour. Um, and a lot of the debate, even though his rhetoric was out there, his videos were out there, a lot of his rhetoric was defended on the grounds of freedom of speech. This is a matter of freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is a fundamental aspect to Western societies. And therefore, when you said, oh, no, this is not free speech, this is actually inciting violence. And that's where we've legally drawn the line historically. It was an uphill battle and it requires and organize, organizing almost 80,000 people signing a petition, getting them organized, getting a number of them organized to call the minister's office so that he can be uh, prevented from coming to Australia. Because under Australian immigration law, you have to pass a character test to be allowed to come to Australia. Clearly by his conduct, this guy had failed the character test. But in my, in my view, you know, his skin color didn't function as a boundary to stop him. I was, you know, I think even people listening here, there is no way that a Muslim brown person could say, I am going to choke someone, you should shoot someone, you should kill them. And there would be, that. there is no way they would have had a chance of coming to Australia. They would have been completely burned and stopped. However, it took so much campaigning to 
this man from coming. And I think partly because of what you said, I think his ideas were somehow baked into the system. They were much more receptive to the system. Mm -hmm. Look like one of them. And so Australia recently started monitoring far right groups' violence. And from the moment they started organizing, now it occupies 40% of the intelligence work, 40%. Before they didn't. But the thing that I found interesting was that minority groups knew that they were not safe because you saw it online, you saw it in the commentary about culling them and killing them. And right. so it was a surprise that you know that these groups existed but it took intelligence community such a long time to arrive where you know people of color had known but had no voice and express and indeed when they express it they were seen as if they just did not understand how this country worked you just don't understand free speech you know it's just you getting offended so it was it was quite it was quite telling but it was also telling because of what that man knew because he said our job is to sort of do these things and for the authority to turn a blind eye. Even he understood the functions of the system to allow those gaps and opportunities that will not be afforded to, to someone else. So it, it, really, it really showed to me either a willing blindness and almost a tactical approval, or at least what is read by this far right group as tactical cultural approval for some of the things they do, knowing very well others will not get away with it. Um, so, but I wanted to ask another question, which I think sort of touch on on this issue, and it's um, it's it's about international law and and racism. Uh, you've mm -hmm. international legal scholarship on refugee has as a race problem. Um, I'm assuming uh, part of it is because they don't think that such a race problem exists. But can you explain what what you mean by this? Yeah, so on on so you're right. I have said that I think that international legal scholarship has a race problem, and and I wish I could say that I'm the only one who said this. There's been a few other people who've observed um, this point, and I'll I'll say something about that. But I do your you know your comments just now made me want to mark something else in the conversation, which is you know where do we go, what are the epistemic sources that we trust to tell us what national problems are and look like and what solutions to them should be and i think in many parts of the global north racial and ethnic minority groups refugees included are not considered reliable epistemic sources about problems and their solutions right so you're describing how you know, it, it's true, many governments are playing catch up now and saying, oh, I guess white supremacy is a, is a threat. There are many communities who have been saying this for a very long time, but who are not considered, you know, reliable or valid or valuable knowledge producers. And I think here there's also a challenge even to mainstream and even liberal rights, you know, groups that are trying to advocate on behalf of refugees, migrants, you know, people of color to say, who are you relying on to produce knowledge about the nature of the problem and the nature of the solution? And part of what it means to undo structures of racial injustice is also to shift how you understand the nature of the problem and who you look to to tell you what the problem is. Um, and I thought your comments very powerfully illustrate um, that. But to come back to the specific question that you asked me about the race problem in international law. So, I, I studied and I went to, to law school, studied international human rights law at what is considered you know, a very fancy school and all of this. My legal education, my international legal education very rarely um, in, in confronted or even named racial injustice as a problem that international law had many things to say about or was implicated in um, producing. I teach international human rights law right now and I use a, a, a text, I've, I did like a survey of textbooks and even in looking at international human rights um, textbooks, the number of them that are actually devoted to thinking about racial equality and non-discrimination and the international regimes that apply to that, the, the coverage is really, really limited, right? So in education and both in scholarship, um, there isn't um, there isn't as much attention to, to um, racial discrimination or racial injustice. And where international legal scholars, and here I'm speaking broadly, whether they're scholars of refugee law, whether they're scholars of, of um, human rights, typically when international law is invoked, it's as a possible solution when you have explicit forms of discrimination and exclusion. It's hardly ever included in the analysis of 
you know, exacerbating forms of, of injustice and inequality on the basis of, of race. And oftentimes its capacity to undo kind of structural forms of injustice are also um, neglected. And, you know, there, there are scholars, refugee law scholars who have come before me who've written about this. B.S. Chimney has written, I think, very eloquently about, you know, the failure of um, international refugee scholarship to really grapple with the, the racialized forms of exclusion that are rooted in the refugee regime. I think this is changing, you know, and I think there's there's the scholars and many scholars actually coming out of Australia, I think, who are trying to shine the light on racialized forms of exclusion in which international law um, is complicit. But to say that international legal scholarship and international law in general has a race problem is to say that it it is kind of characterized by what Deborah Thompson has, has called a, a racial aphasia, you know, an inability and unwillingness to confront the ways in which race structures international law and, and also has structured the way that international legal scholars kind of speak about this. And I think some of this has to do with the controversial meaning of race. I think some of it has to do with who's producing um, international legal scholarship and how racial and ethnic minorities often don't, don't dominate those spaces. And so issues to do with racial and ethnic inequality can also be kind of excluded from those spaces. But um, you know, to the extent that our audience in, includes scholars of international law, international human rights law, international refugee law, or practitioners, or even students, I would be curious if we did a survey, how many of them would say that their education or their practice has really centered um, anti-racism or anti-racial and xenophobic discrimination norms as kind of central to helping them understand the work that they're doing. I would say that we the poll would result in kind of a really low um, number, which I think is, is, is an indictment of our field in a way. In fields like international law, which I think carry almost an intention that they are doing good work, that that ability to self-reflect in your implicit role to either actually make things worse becomes really difficult because part of it would include almost a sense of wanting to deconstruct the very system that you mm -hmm. support. Um, in what ways do you think scholar advocates or anyone in this space can begin to really think about race and incorporate it in their practice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you're you're right to to you know, touch on the themes that, that you're, you're touching upon. Like, I think because most people who are engaged in kind of advocacy on behalf of refugees or other groups understand themselves to be well-intentioned actors who are confronting external, you know, regimes of, of oppression, there can be a reluctance to turn the lens inward to see the ways in which even the movements or the formations that are supposed to be advocating for human rights and justice may themselves internalize some of the systemic forms of, of racial discrimination and exclusion that, that operate. And I think um, conversations like the ones that we're having, I mean, the fact that there is this, um, you know, that the Caldor Center is having this phenomenal symposium and the final conversation is devoted to issues like this, I think speaks to the kind of visibility and, and the kind of need for conversations like we're, the ones we're having um, to be able to change those issues. But I, I think, it just requires taking up the charge. It, it, it requires looking at our syllabi for those of us who are law professors and saying, what would it mean to have a syllabus that actually took racial justice and racial equality um, seriously? I mean, we've, we've spoken about this in a prior conversation, but I think it would be helpful to hear from you what some of the challenges you see in your you know, work that you do. I know that you're in private practice. You're not necessarily focusing on issues to do with you know, racial discrimination in your private practice, but I mean, in your career as an attorney, how easy or difficult has it been to talk about issues to do with racial discrimination, maybe internally and externally yeah. affecting society? Like, I don't know how much of that was a process of your education, as part of your practice, as part of kind of your day-to-day. -day. I'd be curious to hear kind of what your sense of this challenge is in, in light of, of your, own, your own journey. I think it's always been the silent influencer in my life, because I think even choosing to do commercial law was in a way running away from being racialized, you know, to, to do expectations mm -hmm. like you do certain things, I should do certain things because of their history. But it was also a way of um, 
And I, I, honestly, I think it was a way of running away from the task itself, because I, I, I knew that in some ways, as a woman of color, I will have to engage with this outside of my life. And I would have to, and, it, and, and in a way that became true. So I needed an escape, a place where I could sort of just engage intellectually, professionally with something that didn't require the additional task of mm. having to deal with all the other parts of myself equally as in my job as well. I just thought that would be just emotionally exhausting <laughs> to do so, like to, to be working in that space and then to be living in it because yeah, yeah. It's interesting in the way I think it talks and deals with racism. Like I think there's a lot of racism, but there's very limited conversations about it. Mm-hmm. You pick up about racism, you tend to be accused of being the racist, of mm-hmm. totality, of in fact being ungrateful because you know we took you from your refugee country mm-hmm. to uh, and then here you are complaining about racism and discrimination. So it, in a way, it, it it's always influenced sort of the moves that I ma- I, I've made, either to refuse to engage with the conversation by doing something else, mm-hmm. but so I've t- attempted to sort of run away from it. I've spent almost the last four years advocating in this space. Mm-hmm. It consumes a lot of my time voluntary because mm-hmm. we've, we had the, an election in the state I live in that was run on African gangs and there was political vilification of black and brown kids, um, mm-hmm. vilification of black and brown kids it was so intense, it felt as if you were under a siege. You couldn't go to the shopping center without, you know, a front page of African gangs did this. And so everybody in the community felt like a gang member. And, and it, it did have that impact. You know, there was incidents where two boys were kicked out of a, of a library because their presence, they had not done anything wrong, but their presence was somehow terrorizing everybody else. They had to be moved. Like these were just two boys, you know. We've had African kids kicked out of shop because people say, we thought you would steal. Um, so it, it felt like a very weird stuff. And so out of the need to, to just push back, I began to speak in the media and, and, and all these things. And some of, the fi- some of the hardest things I've found is that the language of racism, the way we think about racism is so stuck in some people's mind. You know, they, they think that racism is someone turning up at your door, burning a flag, the Ku Klux Klan, mm-hmm. you know, a, a kind of mantra, where mm-hmm. the, in the other ways that racism continue to present in your life and the way it continue to limit you and diminish you, actually, mm-hmm. it's not seriously enough. And, and people don't have the personal experience to understand the burden that comes with being a racialized body in a predominantly white society and so it's you know it's it's a it's inescapable i think if you're a black and brown person and it mm-hmm. of a level of engagement in addition to just living and being yeah. and, or a this form of detachment really where you just think i'm just not going to deal with it i'm going to pretend it's not in yeah. my hands you know and it's um so uh, what what would be what would be interesting to see is whether the current things, current movements such as the Black Lives movements will have any greater impact in the way we talk about race, you know, in political spaces, in media spaces, um, and in our schools or in our universities. I, I didn't come across, when I studied law, I, there was no subject on racial equality. You know, mm-hmm. I, there was n- really none, none that touch, touch on it. Um, not even in my undergraduate study in, in BA, there is a shyness to deal with race. And there is quite a push now, I think, uh, especially as, as it seems some countries in the West are moving to the right. There's actually a push against it. So what you were seeing in the United States where Donald Trump was, um, I think he abolished the anti-racism trainings and things like that. There's, there's a push in Australia here and, and some of it has been presented more or almost a fight for Western civilization. You know? mm-hmm. And, and, and the idea that, you know, Oriental studies and Black studies and Indigenous studies are taking far more space um, mm-hmm. than they deserve and that our focus as a community should be around how do we structure everybody um, around this concept of Western civilization, you know, mm-hmm. that they should buy into this, this, this principle, which is uh, 
both interesting and incoherent in a, in a country like Australia, where it keeps projecting an image of being a multicultural society. Mm -hmm. Really, when you look whether it's in, in our politics, in our media, in our leadership spaces, it's predominantly a very white country and remains and remain so. So that's, that's been my, my, my personal experience. Um, we've got a few more minutes before it's asking questions, so I just, but I wanted to ask you my final question, which is about the future and touching a little bit on even um, what you think things like the Black Lives Movement, Movement have done and whether they've improved stuff and, or, or even the, the, you know, the pandemic itself, uh, which we would be all aware has really impacted movement and you know, including refugees and, and, and immigrants. Um, in your role as the special rapporteur, have you encountered any kind of positive practices um, either in the instant of settling refugees during this global pandemic or just, just new and emerging kind of thinkings of trends or, or views that have been influenced by um, things like the Black Lives Movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, there's, there's a number of things that, that one could say about the racial justice uprisings that took place, you know, over for us was the summer, but I think it was winter where you guys are, but June, July, um, August. And I think, um, to my mind, one of the most remarkable things was witnessing what I think on many accounts is the most, um, it, basically the biggest racial justice, transnational racial justice uprising that we have witness in, in our lifetime, right? So speaking to people who um, were active in the anti-apartheid struggle or who were active in the civil rights struggle or even active in like anti-colonial struggles as well, my conversations with people who have that kind of lived personal experience um, suggested that what we saw um, in the Black Lives Matter um, uh, protests across the world was something bigger, right? In terms of just the numbers of people that were out on the streets protesting and also the kind of multiracial, multiethnic coalitions that were making issues of racial justice a, a central cause. So that was really, I think, a moment of great hope and excitement and kind of it was very invigorating for me um, to see. And one of the things that was, I think, most powerful about the movement was its insistence that issues of racial injustice be articulated as systemic and structural rather than as about being about just, you know, individual bad actors or bad apples in these different um, contexts. And in terms of, of positive ramifications um, in the context of, of uh, migration and refugees, I would say that I've been heartened to be in more conversations following the, the uprisings that have um, sought to center racial justice issues and conversations around refugees and migrants more so than ever before. So I think what you see is that migrants rights advocacy, refugee rights advocacy is often siloed from racial justice advocacy at the international level and also in most national um, contexts. But I have noticed um, in my conversation with conversations with migrants rights groups and refugee rights groups, a greater willingness and interest in engaging in racial justice claims and also a greater willingness to confront that within migrants rights and even refugee rights contexts, um, issues to do with racial discrimination and racial and ethnic minorities within those groups are often marginalized. So thinking about how you reform um, solidarity movements or human rights movements advocating on behalf of groups in ways that kind of tackle systemic racism as well. And then at the level of states, there have been a few states that I think that have responded really positively. So Portugal, for example, gave um, all people who were in a kind of limbo, in a migration limbo status, they gave them status once the pandemic onset happened and kind of gave them rights that would allow them to be able to cope with the onset of the pandemic in ways that I think were different from the xenophobic responses that many nations had. There were some countries in West Africa that while um, they were shutting down their borders to, to regular um, mobility, were making exceptions for people who, for refugees essentially, who were fleeing conflict. So I think you do have some examples of states that have really attempted to be um, you know, and I don't know if it has if it's tied to the to the Black Lives Matter protest. I don't know that there's that direct um, relationship, but I'm giving you these examples of as as examples of 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 good outcomes. But I will say that side by side with my um, optimism and kind of hope that I feel has been inspired by the movement energy around racial justice is a very deep worry that the window is open but is very steadily closing. You know, and that 
you know, in the different parts of the world where there was a willingness to embrace even the statement Black Lives Matter. I mean, the number of contexts I've been in, you know, high level UN meetings, parliamentary conversations in different spaces where you never thought the words Black Lives Matter would ever be said, right? The number of spaces where those words have been said has been astounding, but already you start to see how any sorts of commitments that may have been associated with that are beginning to be whittled away and narrowed. And I think we're going to go back to a world in not too long where it's as difficult to push for racial injustice as it had been before the uprisings um, took place. So I think in terms of hopefulness, I think we've seen a shift in the way that racial injustice is articulated as a systemic problem. And we've seen more, um, groups, including people who have huge amounts of racial privilege, becoming invested in issues to do with racial injustice. What I don't know is how sustainable and how long term that's going to be. And part of it has to do with, I think, the way that even movements are funded. So you were describing how, you know, you engage in your racial justice advocacy on a voluntary basis. And I think a lot of the energy that has pushed the conversation for racial justice for forward has been by volunteers, by people People who do this work because they're most directly impacted by the regimes that are subordinating them. But I'm often stunned at how little funding there is at global and national levels for work that is explicitly racial justice work. So it's almost like you have to be willing to volunteer to do that work. And then the groups that are funded to do migrants' rights work, human rights work, very few of them have resources devoted to fighting kind of racial justice work. So to me, one thing that would make a difference is changing funding models and changing structures that fund advocacy work to ensure that they are sustaining some of the amazing gains that we have seen made so that it's not constantly falling on the most impacted communities to do this work on top of just living the, the racism or the xenophobia that they're going to be living. So some days I'm really op optimistic and other days I'm, I'm really kind of not that optimistic. That's just uh, I have to say, I think I, I share very much your cautious optimism. Um, you don't want to lose hope, but you also realize how much work there is to do and how as much as there are people pushing for change, there are people pushing against those change. Mm -hmm. And it's that tug of war that is trying to move the needle. needle. Um, and sometimes, I mean, I, 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 I've, I've found that the most exhausting exercise about this is, is accepting that you're probably not going to see the kind of changes you need to see in your lifetime, but that your role is really to sort of occupy this gap, do your best and hope that the next generation meets the challenge and take it a little bit, a little bit further. There's a question uh, for you um, about strategic and pro strategies and programs. Uh, that would be most important for mainstream anti-racism and anti-discrimination work in the process of uh, if you, I think I'm, I'll have to read that carefully. I'll appreciate it if Professor Achimu and Ms. Nguyen identify what strate strategic programs are the most important to mainstream anti-racism and anti-discrimination into the process of refugee and claim adjudication. I don't think I fully grasp what that question is trying to touch on. Well, take a, a stab at this question and I think you know we can think about um, anti-racist or anti-xenophobic interventions as operating at multiple different levels we can think about them as an as as kind of being anchored in advocacy that is trying to change refugee policy in ways that undercut kind of racialized forms of exclusion but I think this question is asking about specifically in the context of refugee claim adjudication like in the decision of whether somebody's going to be granted refugee status are there ways to mainstream anti-racist and anti-discrimination claims and ways of approaching them and I would say I think there's more to be done on this front, right? So the, the Refugee Convention prohibits discrimination on the basis of, of, of um, race. There's a bunch of international human rights treaties that also prohibit discrimination on the basis of race. In a, in a book chapter that I just did for the handbook that Jane and two other scholars are putting out, I talk about how the, the, you know, the analysis that exists of refugee adjudication on the basis of kind of um, racial persecution shows that that adjudicators aren't um, doing as much as they can to take advantage both of the prohibition of uh, discrimination on the basis of race and also the granting of refugee status on the basis um, of race. There's also studies that point to the the prevalence of 
racial stereotypes and ethnic stereotypes and religious stereotypes in the context of refugee adjudication that then undercut anti-racist and anti-xenophobic kind of claim making. So I think there's work to be done both on the part of the lawyers or the representatives of ref refugees who are representing them in a, in a judicative context. But I think there's also work to be done on the part of the status determinators De, um, the status uh, determination actors to ensure that on both sides there is an awareness of the way that racial stereotypes um, function and the way that racialized kind of conceptions about who can be a refugee and who can't be a refugee can really function as, as a mechanism of un undercutting inclusion and exclusion. I'll give you the example of, again, a country visit that I did to the Netherlands where I met with um, um, Muslim, uh, queer Muslim refugees who were describing how in their status adjudication, there was a kind of intersectional form of discrimination where, you know, they had to prove that they could be African Muslims who were queer, right? Because there was a way in which being African and Muslim was being understood as fundamentally in tension with being queer because queerness was being kind of culturally appropriated as, some, as, as, a, as a status that is of, you know, the global North. So, so I think in claim adjudication itself, there is work to be done that would improve anti-racist and kind of anti-discrimination -dis interventions, but it requires naming these problems, um, I think, in the, in the first place. I wanted to pick up on a question about the recent release of um, the report on the alleged crimes committed in Afghanistan by Australian forces. The question here is, um, whether there is a common, whether racism and xenophobia plays a common theme in, in these abuses. And I think the obvious answer is yes, because in my view, what, what racism does fundamentally is to dehumanize a, a, an individual and therefore to open them up to all form of abuses. Because when you've seen someone as less than, um, they don't have rights, they don't have privileges, they're not like you, they are just almost, in, in a sad way, a means to an end, toys at the very end to play with and to misuse and abuse. It, that's, that's sort of the function of what racism allow us to do. It, it gives us those psychological excuses to treat another human being in a way that would have not be permissible in any other context. Um, will this mean that Australia start talking about race? My immediate answer is no. Um, <laughs> Because what we've seen in uh, with these reports is not new. We've seen similar reports in the United States, um, the pictures and the abuse and the torture of, 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 um, of, of prisoners of war, um, and no one has been held accountable for, for those things. There is potentially some space that there will be an investigation for the individuals that engage in these alleged abuses um, to be held accountable. We don't know that. But the reason why I really do say no is because you just have to look at um, what this country has done to First Nation people, to Indigenous people. And if that history hasn't transformed us to the stage of really being conscious about race and racism, if that history hasn't changed Australian perception that we're still having a debate about what day to have Australia Day, um, because some group don't want to move it, even though it reflects to Indigenous people the day in which their genocide began, then I think if we don't, if Australia doesn't solve the issue of racism and discrimination against First Nations people, then I think that that reflects a fundamental attitude that needs to be addressed before we can think that incidents like horrific incidents that are happening in Afghanistan or happen in Afghanistan can be changed. And I, and I think partly what, what, what feeds this horror of racism and racist abuse is because we are used to seeing black and brown people already even in the context of Australia as lesser than. And when you grow up with that perception and you go to another country where you feel that you are powerful and that you are bringing freedom and that you, you're better than, then it's, it, it doesn't seem you know, um, far-fetched that you would commit, allegedly commit these crimes. And I've read or I've heard commentary about some of this report and it's important to note that 
a lot of the issues that were pointed to that was that these crimes were not com committed under stress or in the midst of war. These were almost intentional act of harm and abuse where the existing excuses that normally would maybe permit a reasonable acceptance of this didn't exist, you know? So that tells you something else is happening more than just the pressure of war. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I, I wouldn't go as far as saying that that would make, um, yeah, I don't think Australia would be having conversations about racism as a result of that. And I, I'm, I'm not even sure that even the report really um, touched about, the report by the defense itself even talks about what kind of attitudes impacts, um, impacts that behavior. Initially, before this report came out, I think there was uh, reports about racism and discrimination and even the flying of certain far right flags by members of the force. So I think perhaps, you know, uh, there needs to be a far more conversation within the Australian Defence Force about what race and race racial attitudes plays a part in how our Defence Force react and treat other people that don't, don't are not white. So that, that's my response to it. I'm trying to be very careful because I know that they, it's alleged, alleged crimes. Um, and so one has to be careful not to end up ending up in, I don't want to, by the way, I don't want to end up in the front page of the Herald Sun as <laughs> anti-Australia because we know, you know, members watching here, we know that you know, there, there was harassment of a Muslim young woman until she had to leave this country. And I have no intention of stepping into that um, mm -hmm. as intentionally, you know, if I do step into it unknowingly maybe, but I have no intentions of that. So that's my take on it. Um, I think, you know, your final comment, I think also speaks to kind of how, personally dangerous it can be for you know people who are originally refugees who are naturalized people of color to do to engage in this advocacy because oftentimes your very status and membership can be stripped as a way of silencing you so i know the work you do yeah is very, and very even if it's not professionally stripped like if, even if i don't lose my citizenship right i am I am stripped of the privilege to have honest conversations about the country because if you know, so for example, if I've talked about racism, I've, I've had severe trolling online, been told to yeah. go back where I come from, to be deported with my family. I have been threatened. I have, uh, you know, there was a, with, with another person, we, we had a far right group organized to abuse us and try, trying to get us offline for saying things that to me don't seem controversial. And the idea is that someone who looks like me is always a permanent guest and I must for my citizenship as a permanent guest, not offending anyone, not saying anything too controversial, always knowing where I should stand and belong. You know, um, unfortunately, I'm not really set up for that. <laughs> but it's it's a it's it's a huge cost, and you know, maybe maybe it's a point for for people to to really reflect on because it, it it's it's I don't I would not say sitting here I would not comfortably advise a young black woman to step into this space because first there's not a lot of protective structures outside of it when you step into this place and you have to deal with a lot of this a lot of this personally um we've got three more questions so i'm not going to take any more questions but i might just um ask you um if there are any other things you want to mention or any other comments or just general statement that you'd like to make no, so I think two things I'd like to say and conclude, three things. One is this has been a really amazing conversation, Yado, and I feel like I've learned a lot from, from you and from, from speaking with you. So thank you for that. The second thing is I think you're right to highlight that we often talk about these conversations in ways that don't really highlight the personal toll of doing this work and even having these conversations. And you know, I feel like I too could write a book about the difficulties of doing this advocacy that are, that are rooted in the fact that I am who I am and I look the way that I that I look and it's its own thing and it's something that we have to embrace and really think about. But the final thing I'll say is there's a number of questions that I think really get to something we haven't discussed fully, but you know, what does it mean to move towards a world in which these injustices are addressed? And I want to say that I think my time as Special Rapporteur has made vivid to me that the work of racial justice is actually about unmaking the worlds that we live them in we live in now and remaking them in more just ways right so this idea that you can keep 
the world as it is and, and get racially just outcomes is completely false. There was a question that was talking about um, the COVID pandemic and how even liberal responses have been to say that, you know, migrants need more COVID intervention. And that's really the, the solution to, to solving the problem without fully confronting the fact that, that um, labor is racialized and, and it, it, it puts those communities on the front lines of, of doing the so-called essential work. It's like part of the reason why you have the discourse in that way is because many nations are unwilling to confront who keeps the race, the, the nation running, right? So the final comment I'll say is for those who are interested in what the way forward looks like, to me, the way forward is about remaking the worlds that we are living in and understanding that injustices are baked into the very basic functionings of the economy, of the society, of the law in ways that require um, confrontation. But thanks, and I wish we had more time. <laughs> Well, Tendai and Nadol, thank you so much for that kaleidoscopic discussion. It was an absolute privilege to be a fly on the wall. And I suspect many of us have now added you both to our list of people we would most like to have at a dinner party, uh, once we can hold dinner parties. <laughs> the way in which you were in that conversation able to spotlight systemic biases, many of which even well-meaning people may adopt unconsciously, the way you could pinpoint everyday and personal examples to illuminate and concretize complex philosophical questions really gave me pause for thought. And I know that I'll keep reflecting on this conversation for a long time to come. So thank you both very, very much. Well, our ambition for the Caldor Centres Conference this year was to bring people together across borders for a truly global event, to discuss the key challenges facing the refugee protection regime as we look to shape a post-COVID-19 world. And we're delighted that 600 of you from 50 countries chose to do this with us. Thank you very, very much for your participation and for your engagement through audience questions and in the breakout sessions. I hope that you've enjoyed the conference and we would welcome your feedback via the survey that we've sent out to you. Of course, I'd like to thank all our speakers, our chairs and our facilitators for the breakout sessions who provided us with such stimulating material and really pushed us to think in new directions. Thank you to our conference sponsors for their support, Gail, Paul and Wilcox, Watton and Kearney, Slater and Gordon and Veres. And to those of you who've individually supported the Caldor Centre through donations, large or small, thank you very much our work wouldn't be possible without you. I'd like to thank the UNSW Law Faculty and the Acting Dean, Professor Andrew Lynch, as well as the UNSW student volunteers who've assisted us, Madeleine Barclay, Meryl Mao Zhang and Sarah Arias. Well, as you know, this was the first time that we held the Caldor Centre's conference online. And as you might imagine, there was a huge amount of organisation involved that went well beyond what we were used to. I'd like to express my thanks to the whole Caldor Centre team for their work behind the scenes. But two people in particular deserve a very special mention. First, our centre administrator, Frances Nolan, has gone above and beyond the call of duty to make sure that everything ran smoothly, from finding an appropriate, an appropriate web platform, to arranging sessions in a variety of time zones, to pre-testing the technology with all the speakers, and so on. Secondly, our Centre Executive Manager, Frances Boone, went to extraordinary lengths to ensure that we curated a diverse, representative and coherent series of panels which showcase the voices of people with lived experience of displacement, of academics, of humanitarian actors, of innovators, of journalists and of practising lawyers. Thank you to both our Francises, known as Team Francie, for making this conference happen. It's, it's a huge amount of work and we're sincerely grateful to you. So it now falls on me to draw the Caldor Centre Conference 2020 to a close. It's been a pleasure to interact with you over the past few days, and I sincerely hope we do see you at a future event, whether online or hopefully in person soon. Thank you very much for coming, and please stay safe.